will have to forget yesterday. Absolutely no yesterday exists. No yesterday. Capture today and build tomorrow. That is the, that should be the call of the times. That should be our effort. If, if we can put in an effort just today in this conference hall, that India and Pakistan rise to the occasion, initiate a comprehensive dialogue, and then take steps, effective steps, to generate a propitious environment across the subcontinent, I think we'll be able to move forward. I love India, but never forget I love Pakistan too. I don't belong to India. I don't belong to Pakistan. I belong to the entire South Asian region. It is now the South Asian region that has to be addressed. South Asian region as a whole has to be addressed. Kashmir as a dispute is linked. Kashmir as a dispute is linked inescapably to my tomorrow to stability, and therefore, we'll have to address issues, no doubt about it. How do we do it? How do we do it? When, when, when dialogue happens, two or three things will have to be remembered. A, you have to be, you have to be open. You have to be courageous. You have to be imaginative. No dialogue can proceed if you don't want to move a step forward or a step backward. And this, this can happen only when the dialogue process is initiated. If you do it just today, I'm sure as sure as death that we will be, inshallah, able to see a much better, much brighter tomorrow for Indians, for Pakistanis in the region. Ek, one, two. Well, I will not get back to Kashmir. Kashmir has been discussed by uh, my friends Mir Saab and uh, uh, Tarigami Saab, um, Mr. Gilani, and others fairly effectively. I don't. I don't want to go go to Kashmir. I think. I think. I should confess that we failed on occasions to contribute to the well-being of the people at large. We draw lines. We'll have to learn not to draw lines. We'll have to learn to live together. But this togetherness has to be defined. This togetherness cannot happen in a vacuum. This togetherness has to be developed. But how do we do it? If there are disputes around, well, no disputes and no stability can coexist. Therefore, we should summon up courage and say, yes, we will address disputes and find, find solutions, solutions which are acceptable, which are honorable, and which are durable. And there is no, I mean, no harm saying this um, as far as India and Pakistan are concerned. Number three. I was, I was in Delhi yesterday, day, a couple of days back, I, I saw Mr. Manish Shankar Ayer. Kashmiris are not bad people, they are good people. When we converted, I was a Hindu. My forefathers were Hindu. When, when they converted to Islam, it happened in a debate. It happened in a debate. We are not bad people. Somebody, somebody said, do you know Mr. Mani Shankar? Mr. Opi Shah asked a question. Professor, do you know Mr. Mani Shankar? I, my reply was, my, Mr. Mani Shankar lives in the sacred chambers of Kashmir's collective heart. Remember, friends, it is the Kashmir's wounded soul that has to be addressed. 
It's not an easy job, I understand. What we do is we address the stomach rather than the soul. No peace can return. Nothing will happen. I, I said I will, I mean, sound strange, but please take it. I'm ill. Mr. Mani Shankar says that we have to do it in the larger interest of both India, not only India and Pakistan, but entire South Asian region. This is something, something we must support wholeheartedly. And I trust today's, in today's meeting, Mr. O.P. Shah will make a statement and make a, if, if you like, and make an appeal. If you really want to do something, make an appeal to the concerned people in India and in Pakistan to rise to the occasion and do the needful. That is what is needed. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. No introduction, that's why I didn't say a word about him. Everyone knows he's a scholar. He was a president of the undivided uh, Hurriyat Conference, and the one who initiated the dialogue uh, uh, with uh, people all over. In fact, his first visit outside uh, Kashmir, uh, after, in early 90s, I had the privilege of organizing it and being his host in Calcutta when he came along with Yasin Malik and uh, A.G. Lone, and then, of course, uh, Meer Weiss. May I request uh, Mani Shankar Iyer to offer his comments? And he also needs no introduction. Thank you very much, Mr. Shah. And may I begin by expressing my, my deep gratitude to Professor Abdul Ghani Bhatt for the extraordinarily kind words he has said about me. I'm not at all sure I deserve it, for I have never done anything for Kashmir. But to speak and write about what I think is a problem that desperately needs solution. And I cannot see any way of solving any problem anywhere in the world on any occasion except through dialogue. And my simple plea has been to my government that if you can't talk to Professor Butt, then whom are you going to talk to? This is the voice of sanity. This was the voice of humanity. This was a voice which clearly indicated the path forward. Despite the fact that the present is tied up with the past, Professor Abdul Ghani Bhatt has pleaded for us to forget the past. I'm not sure about that. I think we need to keep the past in mind to find a solution for the future. But certainly, I believe that what he was saying was, let us not become prisoners of the past. What happened in 1947 is that I was six years old. So I was neither responsible for the accession or the terms on which it came, and I'm the inheritor of history. And if, as an inheritor of history, there are injustices in the past, they do need to be resolved. But they cannot be resolved unilaterally, and above all, they cannot be resolved with pellets. I think just what we heard from Gilani Saab, why aren't they used in Haryana? Why are they used in Kashmir? I mean, it's a question which every Kashmiri mother must be asking herself. It's not a question that I ever asked myself until I just now heard Gilani Saab ask about it. It's the most obvious question to ask. We have to, again to use the expression that Bhatt Saab used, we have to appeal to the soul and not to the stomach. The problem is not one of economics is not going to be resolved by pouring money into a very small part of our population. 
when there are a billion and a quarter Indians, you can pour a lot of money into somewhere where there are six or seven million Indians. It doesn't change the larger financial picture for India. And somehow the government of India over these years has believed that you give enough money and it'll shut up their mouths. It never worked. And it'll, it will never work. The British thought they could give us telegraph lines and railway lines and we'd be so grateful that we'd give up our demand for independence. It didn't happen. So therefore, I see some progress in some minds, in some utterly unexpected minds. One is P. Chidambaram, who's no great friend of mine. We've had, we had lots of disagreements in the past. But when I hear a former Home Minister of India say, let us go back to 1947 and the instrument of accession and start from there, I'm startled. At the same time, I'm pleased. Yeah, the instrument of accession is essentially the instrument of accession. They've acceded, as we have said. They've acceded. Now, what have we done since? There are some things that many Kashmiris are very unhappy about. There are several other things which I don't think the Kashmiris would be unhappy about. I mean, I, I don't think in their gut anybody doesn't want the Manrega pro program in Kashmir. I don't think in their gut anybody doesn't want the Sarvashiksha Bhyan in the... I agree with him about the sanitation. But instead of destroying toilets in Kashmir, if we were to build them, I don't think anybody would object to their, at least the money being given to them to build it. But there are a number of other things which we've done, which could include this question of whether the Supreme Court just jurisdiction should or should not extend to Kashmir, on which I see no reason why we can't talk. So number one, my own recent experience with which I've come to this conference in the hope that sharing that experience might give us some lessons about what to do, is that to my astonishment, I was asked by the Congress party, which has long disowned me, to represent them at a meeting in Colombia, which is at the other end of the world. And although I vaguely knew about it, it was not until I got to Colombia that I actually saw, heard, and read about the Nobel Prize that was awarded in uh, December last year to Juan Manuel Santos, the president of Colombia, for bringing about a negotiated settlement of a 50-year insurrection. And what struck me was that to bring it to an end, condition number one was, don't stop your insurrection. It was not made a condition that they have to stop their insurrection. And in reply, the party which was conducting this 50-year insurrection said, you also don't stop trying to suppress us. So in other words, the problem was not solved before the negotiation began. What we are asking from Pakistan is that they satisfy us on every point, and then we'll talk to you. Now, what the hell is, left, is going to be left to talk to them about? If they've completely stopped terrorism, what are you going to talk to them about terror? There's nothing to talk about. If they give you full trade access, there's nothing to talk to them about because you got what you wanted. So you can't enter a negotiation by demanding that the other side do all the things you want them to do after the negotiation, before the negotiation begins. And yet the Indian position with regard to Pakistan particularly, but also with regard to Kashmir, is that you satisfy us first, and then we'll do you the great favor of talking to you. As if it is only in their interest that we talk to them, 
and not in our interest that there be a conversation. So number one was they did not attempt in Colombia to solve the problem before beginning the negotiation. The second very key element of that negotiation was the principle accepted on both sides that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. Now, this enabled them to make progress, but all progress was provisional. You had to come to a final settlement, then all the little pieces would fall in. And I turned to the Kashmiris and say, we'll talk, but nothing is settled until everything is settled. And it opens the possibility for us to, to explore, explore to the limit what is possible and what is not possible, what is in a bottom line interest for India, and what is in a bottom line interest for one or the other member of your interlocutors. Into this is Tarigami Saab's point, that there's also a conversation within Kashmir required, and that there has to be some element of consensus. Now, that too has happened in Colombia, because apart from the major uh, armed uh, army, the revolutionary armed army of Colombia, which was running this with help from Venezuela and Cuba and Bolivia and all those other leftist regimes, there were lots of others, the big, big landlords who were also minting money and against whom the revolutionaries were fighting, they set up their paramilitaries. There were many other smaller groups that also entered the fray, saying that if the big man can make so much money, we too can make it. So in these circumstances, all the time there was discussion going on between the revolutionary parties. Some of them were resolved, some of them were not resolved. The third key thing that happened